Welcome to the Disaster Tough Podcast, where we talk about emergency management by emergency managers. We share stories, lessons, and tips to help keep you moving forward. I am John Scardina, the host. I share my experience as a former federal emergency response official who's responded to some of the most extreme disasters over the past decade. I now lead a private emergency management firm called Doberman Emergency Management. This is episode one. Let's jump in. What a wild ride these like past several weeks have been. Like the spread of coronavirus around the globe, tornadoes in Nashville and Utah, accompanied by another earthquake in Utah. I don't know what's happening there. Uh, to billions of locusts moving across Africa and East Asia. I mean, there's just so much going on. We're in tornado season and flood season right now in the Midwest. And in roughly eight weeks, hurricane season starts. With all these different seasons we have uh, for emergencies, I it's harder for me to think of like of spring, summer, fall, and winter. And I really just think of like tornadoes, hurricanes, wildfires, and ice storms. So how do we keep our heads on straight? Well, it, it always feels like it's happening, right? Well, it's not right. That's wrong. This is where it's really important to remember um, some details. And we want to share these lessons learned with you guys. So first thing first, communication technology helps us stay connected, but that connection makes us feel that if something's happening in another part of the world, it's happening elsewhere too. So I want to share a lesson about that. I still remember waking up with the news of the Japanese earthquake tsunami disaster. You know, there was a lot of times when I woke up in Japan, because I've lived there several times, uh, to those earthquakes, and they weren't really life and you know impacting. You know, I actually have a really funny story about waking up to one of those earthquakes one time, but for another time. Waking up on that crazy day, day one, March 11, 2011, from all these texts saying that there was an earthquake in Japan, I still remember rolling my eyes at the first few texts. I was like more annoyed that I was woken up by those messages than of the news that there was an earthquake in Japan. I thought earthquakes happen in Japan all the time. They're totally prepared. They're fine. And quite frankly, looking back, while they were totally prepared for the earthquake, they have some of the best building codes in the world. There's been lessons learned from the Kobe disaster years prior to that, and that helped them create policies where emergency services buildings, those doors would automatically open so their vehicles could get out to respond. They, they had a lot of things in place. But back to the story. As the text came in, I started to take it more seriously. I, I got so many text messages that I, I decided to get up. I turned on the news, and to my absolute horror, I heard in Japanese, one wave, two waves, three waves, four waves, all about 50 feet high. I couldn't believe what I was seeing. A tsunami. People I cared about, people that I lived around, were being impacted. 20,000 people died and hundreds of thousands of people lost their homes, were evacuated from the Fukushima area. There was food shortages and power outages around Tokyo. I mean, it was, it was intense. It was really tough for them. And as a person who cared about them, it was really tough to watch. If you care about the health and safety of others, you're probably on the right track to being a pretty good emergency manager. Emergency managers are able to care about people and then pause those emotions in the disaster to help make the right call. So you have to be able to do that too. Anyways, despite sitting there and watching the news in complete disbelief at the time, I still got up and I ate my bowl of cereal. And that's what I learned. Years later, when I was bunkering down in the eye of a hurricane and I looked out, I was thinking how weird the sky looked. You ever been in one of those events? You know what I'm talking about. Uh, I recalled that that experience from years prior, and I knew that somewhere right then, someone was safe eating their bowl of cereal. So, with all the crazy things that are happening right now, remember to stay calm. Look for the helpers like Mister Rogers uh, would talk about. Love that, and eat your bowl of cereal to ride it out right? It's going to be okay for most people, especially if we all do our part in the pandemic correctly. We all have to do our part. If we all stay home, 
eat our bowls of cereal, less and less people will be impacted. So that's lesson one. Lesson two, there's no such thing as plan B. Make plan A work. That's a direct quote from the legend, Mr. Rodney Melsick. If you don't know who that is, I seriously question your experience as emergency manager. This guy is like the goat of emergency planning. And he happened to be my boss while I worked on the national strike team. Rodney was famous for saying this, right? There's no such thing as plan B. Make plan A work. You know, what does that mean? And he'll be on this podcast soon, so he can talk about that more. But until then, what he was conveying is that we need to act. Having a very high tolerance for failure is the key to success. You need to do something because disasters get ahead of us quickly. If we don't stop the snow from coming down the mountain at the top, we are going to be chasing it all the way down. The sentiment was recently echoed by, I believe, the executive director of the World Health Organization. I'm going to quote him here for a second. Let me pull this up. He said, but the lessons I've learned after so many Ebola outbreaks in my career are, are be fast. Have no regrets. You must be the first mover. The virus will always get ahead of you if you don't move quickly. And you need to be prepared. And I say this, one of the great things in emergency response, and anyone who's involved in emergency response will know this, if you need to be right before you move, you will never win. Perfection is the enemy of the good when it comes to emergency management. Speed trumps perfection. And the problem in society, as we have at the moment, is everyone is afraid of making a mistake. Everyone is afraid of the consequence of error. But the greatest error is not to move. The greatest error is to be paralyzed by the fear of failure. And I think that's the single biggest lesson I've learned in the Ebola responses in the past. I mean, talk about a mic drop, right? I don't know if you can hear that. That's my mic drop. This is so true. I've been in Ebola responses uh, as well, or the Ebola response at the national level. And uh, I've seen this. Uh, but Ebola aside, because he talked about Ebola, let me share another experience. I like to talk about hurricanes. I've had a lot of hurricane experience. Hurricane Harvey 2017. I responded with the National I'm at West, one of the most professional, strong-willed, hardcore people you'll ever meet. An amazing privilege to work with them. Miss you, team. We were pushing hard. We were pushing hard, harder than I've ever pushed in any disaster. You know, for the first six weeks, I averaged like 125 hours a week or more. I remember someone bringing in a pizza and walking over to grab a slice. And the next thing I knew, I, w I was waking up. Apparently, when I leaned over to grab like the, the pizza, I just fell asleep on the table for like 45 minutes. It was the first time I think I'd slept in probably, I don't know, 30 to 40 hours. It was like that consistently. It was nuts. But I refused to let my team down. And I worked with a team that refused to let the largest hurricane in U.S. history get ahead of us. Those six weeks felt like a lifetime. Rodney, the goat, began making rotations. I was able to go home for some R&R &R after those first six weeks for one week. When I got back to California to eat my bowl of cereal and a check-in of my family, we decided to head down to San Francisco for a day. On the way down, I noticed that there was a smell in the air and checked the reports. Yep, wildfires had started up. About an hour after that, Rodney called me again from Hurricane Harvey and asked if I could, you know, I'm making quotes here with my hands, stop by Cal OES to see how the regional team was doing. I promise this is going somewhere. I'll, I'll get there. Just, just hear me out. And, you know, when I showed up, there was, there was good people again. They were pushing hard especially the people at Cal OES, those Cal OES members, phenomenal people, true professionals. So I found the regional team at Cal OES, and I asked, you know, what do you need? How can I help? Rod sent me. We need data right now. Uh, well, I was a geospatial intelligence guy on the national team. I was the one who tells you who, what, when, where, and how bad. I didn't care about the why. We knew why we were there. Wildfires. So I said, okay, what does right now mean? On the national team, on my team, when Hannes, the FCO team lead, would say right now, he meant if it took more than 15 minutes, 
you're probably behind. So what does right now mean? Well, you can get us to it by the end of the week. What? I was completely shocked. Now, to give you a frame of reference, they were getting live data streams from Cal OES. National Guard was providing a live video feed of the fires. Cal Fire was providing amazing work showing where the fire lines were and what they were doing, the crews. Um, So they did know about the fire. They wanted to know additional information about people and long-term impacts. But again, on the national team, it didn't matter. Right now meant 15 minutes. So when he said by the end of the week, it was like a Monday or Tuesday, I was blown away. After taking a few rounds to figure out what they were actually asking for more specifically, you know, I got it done in minutes. We train like we fight, and we fight like we train. So that regional team, although they were filled with really good people with a lot of talent and seeing them in their careers years later now, I'm really impressed where they're at. But at the time, you know, they hadn't really worked a type one in a type one atmosphere. So they didn't understand how fast they needed to move. We started moving at the tempo that was equal to the threat, right? Equal to the wildfire. After helping them out for several days, I returned back to Hurricane Harvey, the response. And uh, I started watching the reports that were coming out and eventually their after action reports. And I was thoroughly impressed with the outcomes that I saw from their team. They made a plan, they moved up their tempo, they helped a lot of people. So the lesson here is it doesn't matter the disaster, do it quick. Um, So those are my couple stories. Let's talk about the coronavirus specifically. As a private citizen, I, I really crave wanting to be on the front lines helping. But even as an emergency manager, you know, we get it, right? We're the coordinators behind the curtain. Uh, so this pandemic has a lot of problems. It also has a lot of heroes too. So before I get into those solutions, those suggestions that you should do, I just want to make a call out to all those healthcare workers and everybody else, like the doctors, the nurses, also the ones keeping them up and running, the techs and the admins, to supply chain logisticians, um, to those providing the data. Like I said, I'm a big data guy. So seriously, thank you for risking your lives to help save others. I think it's so important we recognize the other unsung heroes too, right? Like the truck drivers that keep us going, the grocery store workers, and the countless of volunteers. Thank you. Speaking of volunteers, I'm going to have a couple volunteer groups on here later this season. We're going to be talking to Patrick McGinn with the Salvation Army and uh, I think Dan Dyer with sacfood.org. Amazing groups. Uh, You should look into them before they even get on here. Uh, Thank you guys again, everyone. So going back to Rodney the Goat Melsick, he shared an article on our blog about the five things that must be happening right now during this pandemic. They are one, implement, two, test, three, contain, four, mitigate, and five, evaluate and prepare. So implement, test, contain, mitigate, evaluate. If you haven't read that article yet, check it out on our website, dobermanemg.com forward slash disaster blog. It's five really important things that need to be happening and they're reoccurring. You must constantly work through each of these steps. If you're stuck, you don't know what to do right now, go check out that blog post and say, okay, here are the five areas. What do I need to do? You know, these things change a lot in a disaster. It's moving quickly. So let's look at one of them, I contain. A week ago, it was no more than 500 people should meet. Then it was 50 people shouldn't meet, more than no more than 50. And then it was no more than 10. Now it's six. The disaster changes and emergency managers need to change with the disaster to save lives. So look at those five areas, pick one and do something. Remember to be smart, look at your data, don't just be opinion based. You know, we reject opinion based analysis because it's a sample size of one. But look at the data, look at those five areas and make a decision and act. The next solution, you know, I'm not seeing a lot of information or attention on the fast food industry. Man, this is one of the easiest ways to get people sick, and it's so straightforward to fix. So let's break that down. A single car comes through your drive-thru, and hopefully they're not showing any symptoms. 
They hand over their cash at the first window, uh, which is pretty gross. Maybe it's a card. That's even better. But they hand over their card or cash uh, to the cashier. And then they go down 30 feet and they grab their food from the checkout person. Like, Do you see the problem here? This shouldn't be an issue. I'm not talking about shutting down fast food. I get it. We have a lot of people on the road right now saving lives and sustaining life, and they need to eat food. Like they can't pack days and days of food in their car. Fast food is helping them keep going too. So I appreciate that. What I'm talking about is the process of containment, the drive throughs drive throughs are single file lines already, one person at a time. Even Chick-fil-A with its amazing food, not a sponsor, eventually files down people to one car at a time. You know, they have control. You have control uh, in your fast food restaurant. So fast food in a pandemic should stop doing cash. It should take card only and put the card reader on the outside of the building. You know, some people might ask, but what about people stealing the card readers or, you know, messing the card readers up? Well, that's a good question. You might ask that. Well, Taco Bell, look at them. I mean, again, not a sponsor, but they put card readers on outside of their buildings years ago. You know, unfortunately, it was not fully implemented, and I haven't really seen the concept actually being used despite the card readers being there, but the concept was there. If you put a lockbox on the card reader overnight, then you have, uh, then you have mitigated that, that problem. And if you have a single file line, it's much better to have someone on the inside monitoring so that nobody has to do uh, to be there to get hurt, you know, to get sick. So you can have somebody in, inside making sure nobody does st- anything stupid during store hours and then lock it up during the night. And then again, 30 feet down, you want to put food in front of the window uh, on, on like a small window table. I don't really know what it's called, but, you know, like those small tables in front of the window Again, single file line, person in the checkout puts the food on the counter, shuts the window, somebody comes up and grabs the food, and you've now mitigated your problem. Now, if you're wondering, okay, what about the food mismatching? Well, as long as you have on a screen what that food and the food items are when somebody's paying, those 30 feet down, there shouldn't be any, mis- any mistakes. And you shouldn't have to worry about people stealing the food off the, the, uh, that table because your cars are blocking people from coming up and the food's only out there for 10 seconds when the person passes from paying to picking up their food. So you've now mitigated the problem. I honestly don't know why this isn't a thing already. We're not a cash-based society anymore in the U.S. We can move up. We can upgrade our systems. We should do that. And most importantly, we should protect the workers from getting sick by implementing strategies that protect people. Nobody should be handing anybody anything right now. And quite frankly, it's just a better practice to to have the people do the card reader on that side. They can just touch their phone or they can touch the card on the card reader, go down, pick up their food, and they're gone. Protect them. Protect your business. Um, if you're an emergency manager or in security or in another form of a leader in fast food, talking about supply chains, Please implement better fast food protocols to protect everyone. It's probably a big way to get people sick right now. We can just stop it. So my last suggestion is for those emergency managers working in business. It's too late to create a comprehensive accounting of operations plan or a coup plan if you haven't done it yet. But you can still grab elements from it. One of my big things right now, especially if your org has already started to move as it should have been, is formalize a short document that notes the delegation of authority. I'll repeat that, the delegation of authority. If the standard operating procedure is to have a leader, maybe the head of the agency or the owner, make sweeping announcements, if that leader becomes sick or otherwise incapacitated, do you have it in writing that another person down the food chain has the authority to act on behalf of the business? This is really important especially for those small to medium-sized organizations that are likely not to have this in place. The words that you want to be using in that delegation of authority need to include the words, who will act in the best interest of the company. So the owner should have something in writing where, for example, the, the director of operations 
if she is going to pass it on those responsibilities, the director of operations under X, Y, and Z conditions who will act in the best interest of the company will assume those roles related to personnel, property, and continuity of operations. You want that in writing. You want them to sign it. Uh, as you can tell, even approaching this topic is a pretty heavy hitter for you know those companies because it has legal ramifications. It also has re- legal ramifications when someone out of you know quote unquote goodwill tries to act. Oh my gosh, I haven't heard from the owner of the company in like five days. Our workers are not working. We want to pay them. Let's send them home and let's give them pay. That has legal ramifications to make that without the authority to do that. Make a delegation of authorities, very, very short document. Put in your conditions like we haven't heard from the owner or the person making these calls. And, you know, you determine but three days or five days we haven't, um, you know, we're not hearing word back. So that's one. The second one would be, for example, the owner getting coronavirus or becoming ill. Um, so they can't make decisions. Again, another person who's uh, temporarily able to do that. And once that owner comes back, then they would automatically resume those standard operating procedures where they make those calls. So put that into place, make that keep moving and get that done. So those are my five things from today. Uh, You want to stay calm, even in global events where there's people impacted by a global event like the pandemic. Look for look for the helpers and look for the people who are still able to eat their cereal. Number two, have a high tolerance for failure. It's better to act than to do nothing in disaster response. Three, review Rodney, the GOAT, Mel6, critical strategies um, at DobermanEMG.com disaster blog to make sure that you're looking at those five things. Four, let's protect fast food by upgrading how to interact with customers, i.e. better social distancing techniques. And five, put in place a delegation of authority document. Make sure that's in place across the board, whether you're the school or your business agency, whatever, you, you need to make sure that document's there. So stay calm, high tolerance or failure. Five strategies to do right now, protecting fast food through social distancing and um, delegation of authority. I hope you enjoyed this episode. I'm John Scardina, the owner of Doberman EMG and host of the Disaster Tough podcast. Please like and subscribe. Uh, We want you to come back. And if you can send me a note of what you thought or additional ideas, love to hear that. You can email us at info at DobermanEMG.com. Again, that's info at DobermanEMG.com. Thanks.